Hello everyone and welcome to the first webinar of the Fit for Food 2030 webinar series titled Towards Sustainable Food Systems Through Research and Innovation. My name is Katrin Bongart and I work at UKIC and with our colleagues at ILSI Europe, we have developed this webinar series as part of the project Fit for Food 2030. Today I'll have the pleasure of being your moderator. In this first webinar, we are going to be discussing the European food system and its many challenges, the Food 2030 policy framework, as well as look to Fit for Food 2030 as a unique case study. While this project is centered on European food systems, we believe that the learnings from the project can be applied to food systems around the world. Now, before we get started, I have just a couple of general announcements. For those of you joining us on Twitter, you can follow us on at SciFoodHealth, and you can tweet us by using the hashtags on the screen, hashtag FitForFood2030 and or hashtag Food2030EU. Additionally, we're going to be running a live Q&A session after our presentations where you have the option or the chance to ask our presentation presenters the questions. You can submit your questions and comments in the ask a question feature on the bottom hand of your screen. If you have a specific question for one of our speakers, can we please ask that you write their name before the question so I can delegate the question accordingly. All the webinars are going to be recorded and will be made available through the registration page as well as the Fit for Food project website, which is www fitforfood2030.eu. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first, first speaker, Dr. Kelly Parsi. Today, she will be talking to us about the European food system and its many challenges. Hello, my name is Dr. Kelly Parsons and I'm a research fellow in food policy and governance at the University of Hertfordshire in England. And I specialize in policy and governance structures influencing food systems. I'm going to present a short basic introduction to the concept of the food system and apply this to the European context, the European food system. I'll be drawing heavily on work I did with colleagues in my previous role at the Centre for Food Policy, which included producing a set of accessible briefs on the food system, integrated food policy, policy coherence and governance, and a policy brief on connecting food systems for co-benefits for the Austrian presidency of the EU in 2018 with Professor Corinna Hawkes. And links to these publications are at the end of the presentation. And the flower diagram you can see here in the background is from a brief titled, What is the Food System? And will be the basis of the presentation. My first message is that the food system is understood, defined and depicted in many different ways. You may have seen different diagrams which attempt to map the system. The food system flower is me and my co-author's version of that. And the, de definition, and the definition we use to accompany that diagram is the interconnected system of everything and everybody that influences and is influenced by the activities involved in bringing food from farm to fork and beyond. And you can see that this takes a broad perspective of what the food system is. That leads to my second message, which is that our understanding of food as a system is changing. Historically, the food system has been characterized as the activities that take food from farm to flush as seen here. Food is produced, harvested, gathered or slaughtered, cleaned, packed and stored, and typically processed in some way, from cutting and canning to complex manufacturing, and then distributed and sold and marketed to people, and then it's eaten. And there's also spoilage, waste and disposal which happens throughout this process, and research and technology influence all those parts of the chain. This is the food supply chain, typically depicted as linear and moving from one stage to the next. And the predominant focus has been at the production end of that chain because our goals were around ensuring enough food was produced. More recently, as our knowledge of the broader impacts of this food supply chain has grown, our understanding and characterization of the food system has broadened to include many different influences on and impacts of that chain, which are sometimes referred to as system drivers and outcomes. Understanding that economics, politics, the environment, health and society all shape and are shaped by the system necessitates a broader perspective of the system, which is wider than the supply chain. 
This is represented in this flower diagram by the coloured petals, which show the broad dimensions of the system and the considerations within them are represented by icons. The arrows and overlapping highlight how there are interconnections between all of these different spheres and with the supply chain at the centre. I'm now going to talk through those spheres or dimensions in the European context, and in particular about the food system challenges associated with those different dimensions. Unless otherwise specified, the statistics quoted come from the Connecting for Co-Benefits report that you can find at the end of the slide deck. The food system is an economic system of businesses, jobs and skills. Food is bought and sold, value is generated and allocated, and people have an economic impact through what they buy. In Europe, for example, trade industry body Food Drink Europe describes the food sector as a key pillar of the European economy and the first manufacturing industry in the EU in terms of turnover, value added and employment. And there are 44 million jobs linked to farming, food processing and related retail and services. And the sector is also responsible for significant levels of trade. With this comes challenges. Economic Inequity is widespread in the food system, whether in terms of farmer share of value or proliferation of low paid jobs, consolidation or trade imbalances. And the European food system is no different. It's characterised by inequity. Agricultural incomes lag behind other sectors, for example. And the food sector is more broadly uh, characterised by precarious low paid work. Agriculture receives less share of value in EU food chains than other parts of the chain. And there are high levels of market concentration, for example, in food manufacturing and retailing. Moving on to the health dimension, the food chain influences diet, nutrition, food safety and well-being. Modern food chains are highly successful in terms of range and availability of food, but they are also associated with health related challenges like malnutrition and diet related disease, which are the world's largest cause of ill health and early death. Eating unsafe food kills hundreds of thousands of people per year and working in the food chain is associated with health impacts from accidents to pesticide poisoning and stress. In Europe, for example, 62% of the adult population is overweight and Europeans eat more meat, sugar and fats than recommended and fewer whole grain cereals and fruit and veg. Food production depends on the right environmental conditions, air, climate, water, sea, land and the biodiverse flora and fauna which live in and on them. And yet the modern food chain is a major contributor to the destruction of nature in terms of land and fresh water use, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. For example, in Europe, the agriculture sector is estimated to be responsible for around 11 to 12 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. There have been significant declines in European biodiversity, for example, a 32 percent decline of common farmland birds in the EU between 1990 and 2015. The sector is also an intensive resource user. Cultivating, processing, packing and bringing food to the table represents 26% of total EU energy consumption. 40% of total water use in the EU is allocated to crop irrigation alone and 100 million tonnes of food are wasted annually. The social dimension is where the people in the system become more visible. We know that food can act as a social glue and create community cohesion and regenerate socially deprived areas. It's an important link to historic traditions and cultural representation and a focus of celebrations. It's part of people's social identities and central to people's quality of life in terms of their access to food. But the modern food system is associated with a lot of food culture, knowledge and skills, and people are experience confusing messages in, in the media and are open to influence by advertising. These trends are more difficult to quantify than challenges in other dimensions, so there's less evidence on them. But we do know that, for example, around inequity, in 2016, 43 million people, nearly 10% of the EU population, were unable to afford a quality meal every second day, according to IPES Food and food banks across Europe distributed over 2.9 million meals daily to 6.1 million people in 2016. Finally, let's talk about the political dimension. Food is political. Food policy, for example, which can be defined as all the policies that affect the food system and what people eat, is debated and contested. There are many different rules which affect the food chain and the system more widely. Legislation, taxes, subsidies and so on. And there are just as many different views on the role of these various policy solutions in addressing food systems challenges. 
The political challenges around food systems relate to unequal power relations that exist throughout the system in terms of who makes decisions and who makes money. There are also challenges of poor food system governance. At present, incoherent policy making and short term political cycles and thinking and a lack of political will to tackle food systems are argued to undermine a longer term approach to addressing challenges. There's general agreement that policy and practice addressing the food system need to be better joined up or connected. And we've seen multiple calls from within EU policy and outside for a new cross cutting approach to food policy. And you can see a few examples on the slide here. The reason these calls for more joined up or more integrated or more coherent policies happen is there are lots of attempts to address different parts of the system taking place, but these currently happen largely in isolation from one another. The diagram now highlights some of the horizontal fragmentation of interventions on the food system. We have economic policies, nutrition policies, environmental and social policies related to food taking place independently. These specialised goals and interventions can make sense when viewed in isolation, but their fragmentation can lead to or exacerbate tensions between these different interventions and can lead to unintended consequences where one action where these specialised goals and interventions can make sense when viewed in isolation, but their fragmentation can lead to or exacerbate tensions between these different interventions or lead to unintended consequences where action in one part of the system has a negative impact elsewhere. For example, there can be tensions between the economic and health dimensions if trade policy means more foods available around the world, but that food is high in fat, salt and sugar, the kind of food nutrition policy is trying to res restrict. can be incoherence between goals in the agriculture and nutrition dimensions if our policies and innovation agenda support growing a limited number of crops which are not the most nutrient rich. Tensions between innovation policy and livelihoods and equity if technological innovation is monopolized by larger companies or certain producers can't afford to introduce them. Agriculture and environment dimensions can be in tension if food production causes greenhouse gas emissions which environment policy is trying to reduce. And food safety and environmental goals around reducing food waste may be incoherent if measures to protect food safety, such as date labeling or packaging, lead to increased waste. And here are just a few examples of diverging policy goals which have come to the fore in Europe, which we identified in the Connecting Co-Benefits report. For example, restricting agricultural inputs like neonicotinoids to protect biodiversity versus agricultural economic goals to increase yield. One important tool in addressing these tensions and conflicts is through looking at coherence. Policy coherence can be defined as the alignment of policies and other interventions that affect the food system with the aim of achieving health, environmental, social and economic goals to ensure policies designed to improve one food system outcome don't undermine others. This diagram highlights in a simple way the importance of making sure interventions are holistic so that policies support rather than undermine one another. For example, a health policy to improve fruit and vegetable intake through a social marketing campaign might be undermined if public investment or research and innovation policy focuses on cereals rather than fruit and vegetables. But the intervention can also be positively reinforced by innovation policy, for example, if business, businesses are supported to create healthy and food. But the intervention can also be positively reinforced by innovation policy, for example, if businesses are supported to create healthy fruit and vegetable based products which consumers want to eat. I'd like to end by highlighting two general principles for addressing food systems more effectively, thinking systemically and acting systemically. Thinking systemically is about under, understanding these different connections between actions taken across the system. It's also about building a common understanding of the challenges and solutions, because there are currently many differing ideas about what we want to do or what we should do. The example of the role of meat in a future healthy and sustainable food system is a clear example. One way to act systemically is to address and prioritize coherence by ensuring any policies or other interventions do no harm through unintended consequences and that they maximize co-benefits elsewhere in the system. Another way is to create processes and structures which enable connections in understanding and action to happen. 
cross-sector collaborations, conversations across sectors and policy domains will need to be supported by some more cross-cutting governance processes and structures than are currently in place. One way to do this is through an integrated food policy, which brings together all the policies and actions in all of those dimensions of the system in one place, like the forthcoming EU farm to fork strategy should hopefully do. And if you're interested in finding out more about integrated food policy and the role of governance structures in food systems, then two short briefs on these are listed in the final slide deck. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Kelly. And just a reminder for all of you that have just joined us, if you have any questions specifically for one of our speakers, please submit them in the chat box below. And do remember to include their name. Now our next speaker is Dr. Karen Fabry, and her presentation is titled Food 2030, a research and innovation response to the food system challenges. So hello, my name is uh, Karen Fabry. I'm a Deputy Head of Unit of Bioeconomy and Food Systems within the uh, Directorate General of Research and Innovation of the European Commission, which is part of a directorate called Healthy Planet. So I'm going to talk to you about our initiative called FOO 2030 to transform food systems through research and innovation policy and how this is being, going to be deployed within the context of Horizon Europe. So we now, with the new commission, we now have a new policy context uh, within which to, uh, to orient our research and innovation activities. This is the new European Green Deal. Um, within the context of the new commission, there are also other uh, very interesting policy priorities which cover uh, an economy that works for people, a Europe fit for the digital age, promoting our European way of life, a stronger Europe in the world, and a new push for European democracy. This new policy framework provides very exciting opportunities for uh, food system research uh, and innovation and also uh, relevant EU policies. So what's, in the, what's the aim of the European Green Deal? It's to make the EU the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And this should enable us to produce, move, and consume uh, in a more environmentally responsible way um, through cleaner energy and green technologies, through a truly circular economy, and uh, uh, to protect biodiversity, and to ensure that the transition is just and socially fair. Now, one of the measures or elements that is contained with the European Green Deal is this farm-to-fork strategy for sustainable food systems that everyone is very keen on learning more about. Now, this strategy is expected to be adopted at the end of March, I think 25th of March, so it will be coming out very soon. So the objective is will call for a transformation of food systems to make them more sustainable, to make them healthier, climate resilient, and uh, also to provide new business opportunities for all actors in the food system, ranging from primary producers all the way to processors, retailers, uh, food service sector operators, and, uh, and also consumers and citizens. So a roadmap was published on the 17th of February for this farm to folk process, and the consultation remains open until the 16th of March. So you still have a few days to submit your reactions to, to this. Um, the publication of the communication, along with its targets and action plan, is uh, foreseen for the 25th of March. And for your information, we also have activated our scientific advice mechanism within the Commission that will publish an opinion on food systems uh, also in spring uh, of 2020. So there's some very interesting things happening with respect to food systems right now. So what have we done uh, to get us to where we're at? Well, we have looked at the science um, very thoroughly to uh, help us uh, uh, single out which could be the most important levers of change of this very complex system that is the food system. We've also explored the regulatory and policy context to see where it is that research and innovation can really also support the science policy interface. And we've been communicating over, the number, uh, over a number of years, not just communicating, but really convening and mobilizing all actors throughout the food system to, uh, to see how we can work together in partnership to transform food systems. 
And it's within this context that we have developed the Food 2030 um, uh, Research and Innovation Policy Framework to future-proof our food system and nutrition. So we had a vision for food systems whereby by 2030, we could ensure that food systems become sustainable, responsible, diverse, um, ensure that they remain competitive, that they are inclusive, and that they uh, are also resilient. So this is the vision that we built through which uh, we came to the realization that we needed to focus our work on delivering four priorities that we also use as co-benefits. Huh? The first is nutrition for sustainable and healthy diets, which basically covers everything that deals with eating healthy and safe food. The second priority is to achieve climate smart and environmentally sustainable food systems, uh, food systems that can help mitigate climate change and also adapt to climate change. Uh, the third priority or co-benefit is circularity and resource efficiency in food systems, and finally, innovation and empowerment of communities. And by communities, we mean neighborhoods, we mean cities, we mean regions. And how can we do this? Well, by deploying research and innovation through uh, to achieve research breakthroughs, uh, to foster innovation and investment, and also alignment of research and innovation across funders, to foster open science, education, and skills, and ensure that we also collaborate uh, very closely with our international partners. So this uh, slide shows our Food 2030 journey, which began in 2015 um, during the World uh, Expo held in Milan, which was focused on food systems. Uh, and it's, it's uh, during that occasion that the European Commission had over 200 events and one outcome of that process was that a number of commissioners got together and uh, agreed that we needed to have what we called back then a European research area for food systems. And it's this notion of a European research area that then we renamed Food 2030. So since then, we've had a number of high-level events, again, mobilizing various services within the commission, uh, commissioners so at very high, let's say at, at political level, and also uh, multiple actors across the food system. Uh, we have set up an expert group of 12 very um, renowned experts to help us do uh, a kind of assessment, uh, take stock of where, you know, what the achievements had been until then and propose uh, some recommendations. Uh, we worked together across services of the commission. Many DGs worked, put their heads together to, to write a baseline document, which was our staff working document that came out in 2016. And within that document, there were a number of recommendations. And it's been on these recommendations that we have been working now uh, for the past few years. So uh, since its start, we've had, as I said, a, a number of events, and we are now very keen to see how we can um, uh, put together some milestones to get us to the UN World Food Summit in 2021. And I think that within that context, there is room to showcase how research and innovation can make a difference in driving food system transformation. So uh, other achievements include a whole series of publications that have tried to really bring together many ideas from stakeholders on how we should be transforming food systems. So I invite you to consult um, those particular publications on our website. And we have set up uh, the Fit for Food 2030 engagement platform. And of course, you'll be hearing more about that. Now, um, just to mention that within the context of the engagement platform of Fit for Food, we really try to build in the need to foster responsible research and innovation so as to bring in civil society and multiple actors to sit together and upstream and throughout the research and innovation process. So this is a very important platform for us to help us deploy FU 2030 within cities, within regions, within, you know, also at national level. The Food 2030 expert group delivered a very interesting and valuable report on our past achievements and provided recommendations of where we should be focusing our future research and innovation efforts. 
Another very interesting piece of work has been done by the member states through the Standing Committee for Agricultural Research. They have set up a working group dedicated to food systems, and they did a mapping exercise within eight or nine countries where they tried to examine exactly where they were um, placing their research and innovation funding. So in which areas of food systems were they dedicating research and innovation funds? So this is a very interesting report to see how di different member states are reacting to food uh, systems research and innovation. So we put all that information together um, from our events, from the reports, from the publications, from the stakeholder con consultations. And um, in view of Horizon Europe, we were asking ourselves, well, what can we do to actually now move towards action within the context of the new framework program? And so we developed a concept of 10 Food 2030 Pathways for Action. Now, all of these actions, how do we pick them? Well, we know that they're leverage points for systems change. All of these can actually contribute to um, delivering multiple benefits, so co-benefits, to our Food 2030 priorities. The first one of these pathways is governance and systems change. The second is food system transformation, urban food system transformation. Then we had food from the oceans and freshwater resources. Then proteins and dietary shift, food waste reduction, and also uh, that includes a portion on packaging, uh, microbiome world, then healthy and sustainable personalized nutrition, food safety systems of the future, food systems Africa, and finally, food systems and data. So these are the areas that we think um, have great potential in terms of research and innovation that we would like to um, drive through Horizon Europe, uh, in particular through the intervention area on food systems. So how do we see Food 2030 be deployed? Um, this is a diagram that shows uh, in, in the orange part how we would like to use different instruments and, and parts of um, say Horizon Europe programming, the more traditional forms of, of, of programming for collaborative research. Uh, we see uh, a role for a food systems partnership under Horizon Europe uh, to, uh, that, that could play a role in bringing together uh, a wide diversity of actors and to help align research and innovation. Then in green, you have our activities that relate to uh, working with regions, with cities, with the presidencies, um, in the international context also, and the work through the Standing Committee for Agricultural Research, for example. And in the purple areas, you see our work that relates to bringing in foundations, so how, seeing how we can better align our work with industry, with foundations, also trying to see how we can create synergies with other funds um, that exist uh, today. Um, so this is how we would like to deploy within, uh, within the future years, how we could deploy Food 2030 within Horizon Europe and, of course, beyond. And I have just a few uh, words I'd like to say on how Horizon Europe is structured. There are three main pillars under Horizon Europe. And uh, much of the work on food systems will be done in Pillar 2 in a cluster uh, that groups together food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment. Um, and within that cluster, there are a number of intervention areas. And one intervention area is food systems. Another intervention area that is extremely relevant is agriculture, forestry, and rural areas. Um, but food systems, elements of food systems will in fact be dealt with also in other pillars, but the other pillars are, are more of a bottom-up uh, process. So uh, I think we will see uh, many opportunities for food systems research and innovation throughout Horizon Europe, either through the dedicated intervention area or through the other pillars. Uh, just a word uh, on missions now. So missions are a new concept for Horizon Europe. They're really meant to be big campaigns where we mobilize multiple actors and, and policymakers and citizens around very targeted issues where we think we can make a difference within the next few years. 
There are five mission areas. The first is adaptation to climate change, including societal transformation. Then we have a mission on cancer, which we suspect may have some elements in relation to cancer prevention that could be linked to nutrition, for instance. Um, we have a mission on healthy ocean seas, coastal and inland waters, another one on climate neutral and smart cities, and finally one on soil health and food. So please do keep your eyes on, on these missions. Um, we have mission boards that have been set up for these, and they're currently in the process of coming up with scoping papers to see which specific areas or which targets could, could be addressed in these big mission campaigns. I mentioned that we would have a food systems partnership, so the title of this partnership will be called Safe and Sustainable Food Systems for People, Planet, and Climate. And the idea there is really to encourage a, a better research and innovation policy governance uh, from portfolio management to strategic long-term impact on food systems to better alignment, leveraging, and investments. And this partnership, which we expect will probably re be rolled out officially in 2023, uh, will also need to link up with other new partnerships that are being proposed. For instance, there's one on agroecology, another one uh, linked to agriculture and data, another one on biodiversity, on cities, on circular uh, bio-based sectors. So there's, uh, I think, much possibility for cooperation also with other partnerships. So that's all I have to say to you today, and I'd like to thank you very, very much for your attention. If you do want to follow our activities, we do have a stakeholder list that uh, you can register to, and you can find us also on Twitter through the hashtag Food2030EU if you want to uh, converse with us and stay tuned of our activities. Many thanks. All right. Many thanks for that overview of DGR TV work, Karen. Uh, just as a reminder, any questions for Karen should be directed to the chat box below, and please do include Karen's name. Last and definitely not least, we have Jacqueline Borsen, Professor of Innovation and Communication in Health and Life Sciences, and she's also the Director of the Athena Institute, Faculty of Science at the Vrije University in Amsterdam. As Project Coordinator of Shift to 2030, Jacqueline will present the project as a unique case study of using responsible research and innovation for food systems transformation. Well, it's a great pleasure to um, tell you more about the unique case study uh, that Fit for Food 2030 aspires to be. Um, the project is a support action to the European Commission to implement Food 2030. And Food 2030 has been established a couple of years ago and is a policy framework of the European Commission on food and nutrition security in Europe and how that research and innovation can contribute to achieving that goal of food and nutrition security. So in that sense, this project really tries to bring the message of uh, the Food 2030 policy framework further, but more importantly, it tries to operationalize it. Um, I will tell a bit more about the philosophy of the, that is behind this thinking on research innovation as a catalyst for food system transformation. Well, first of all, we know that there are, and other speakers have already talked about this as well, there are quite a number of problems in our society in relation, first of all, to food production, uh, where we are increasingly seeing climate change having an impact on, for example, drought or rainfall. We see production methods, such as extensive use of pesticides, but also uh, animal food product, animal production, where uh, use of antibiotics uh, increases uh, resistance levels to antibiotics, and the, the frequent transportation of animals has strong animal welfare implications, but also a uh, big carbon footprint. Um, but this is on the production side. On the other end, if we move towards the consumption side, we see on the one hand that still a lot of people don't get enough nutrition and, and, and are severely malnourished in the sense of stunting and wasting. On the other hand, in the more higher income countries, 
we see an excessive uh, amount of food being consumed, uh, which leads to overweight weight and obesity in many of us. And nowadays we are talking a lot about the uh, obesity, obesity gene epidemic. So um, there are many of these problems, both with respect to environment, carbon footprint, pesticide use, biodiversity loss, and on the other hand, health implications, uh, with respect to um, non-communicable diseases, basically, because obesity is a very strong uh, uh, driver for many NCDs. And um, we see that the food systems that we have nowadays don't seem to be able to curb these problems. Um, so this is not a future that we would like to see for us. Uh, we want to have a healthy, um, sustainable planet. Uh, so the big challenge that we have before us in the coming 20, 30 years is basically how can we curb the, the route that we are taking now with our food and food systems towards this vision of a more equitable, healthy, sustainable planet. Now, what is the route that we can take to that vision? In Food 2030, the idea is that research and innovation has a strong role to play to achieve that goal. And that, um, so the focus is on, with research and innovation, to create a sense of urgency. We can better understand the problem. We can also identify, develop, and test breakthrough innovations. And with innovations, we don't mean just technical ones, but also very much social innovation, can organize things differently. And, not last but not least, we can understand the dynamics better. Because a food system is a complex system, as we have heard before. So to understand facilitators and barriers in that system is important. There are synergies, but there are also trade-offs. So Food 2030 tries to achieve this better future, a future-proof food system through research and innovation. So what do we need to do? It turns out, however, that we see that our research and innovation system is not so well equipped to achieve, uh, to contribute to future-proof European food systems. There are barriers. And some of the barriers are, first of all, the fragmented research and innovation landscape, both within science, where we have silos between the dif disciplines, and we see it in the societal sectors where we see a clear divide, for example, between agriculture and health and nutrition and the retail. So these silos actually, as the word silo already says, don't communicate with one another. So how can then such a fragmented research and innovation landscape actually contribute to such a holistic view as a food system? Secondly, there is a very much importance of linking up with citizens and consumers, civil society organizations, as important players within this transition process, this transformation process. So it's not only about production, it's also very much about consumption. And if you want to change diets, if you want to change what people do, if you want to change behaviors, then we do need to have the involvement of citizens as well. However, in research and innovation today, we see very low involvement of these types of actors. Actually, when we say before with the fragmentation and with the involvement of citizens, we're actually talking about inter- and transdisciplinary research. And the interesting thing is that if we, see, if we look at academia, research institutes, to what extent these support inter- and transdisciplinary research, we find that that support is pretty low. And this is also true for the investments. So we see on the one hand private sector with investments and of 
course, they invest in food, in the food sector, but they don't invest in future-proofing European food systems. So most of the investments go to traditional conventional research and not to the type of research we need nowadays. Unfortunately, public funding is also not very conducive to that. Uh, so um, uh, what, we, what we see is that they usually have open calls and not so much thematic. So food as a topic to, to focus on is, um, yeah, is not negligent, but is, is much less receiving emphasis than, than some more topics like biotechnology or um, uh, specific agricultural topics. Um, all in all, we need much more knowledge and awareness for the importance of the type of research and innovation that is needed for food and, nutri food and nutrition security. So there's quite a bit to do, and that's exactly where um, where Fit for Food comes in. And we want, first of all, to stimulate what we call system thinking in research and innovation. And system thinking is a radically different way of looking at how the world works. It works with exactly the fact that everything is interconnected. A system is a complex whole and we need to therefore synthesize the different parts to a unified view. That actually also means that we need to anticipate the future and design and implement our innovations accordingly. So it's a different way of setting up our research. And nowadays, the conventional way of doing research is either the linear view where we have clear ideas about cause, simplified ideas about cause and effect, or at most a linear view. However, a more systemic view requires that we do what we call complex system thinking, and it's thinking in networks where different parts interact with each other back and forth, not just in a unilinear way. The second important thing that we want to do with Fit for Food is promote stakeholder engagement. So if we're looking at the challenges and the vision of where we want to go, and when we have in the middle this research and innovation, that's a compartmentalization in itself as well. Huh? So on one end, we have these problems with their, with their stakeholders. On the other hand, we have the vision on where we want to go to. It's again society that needs to implement the results of research and innovation. Actually, the system thinking, when you really think it through, let's say, it means that research innovation should become part of that problem context and interact with the stakeholders in to, buy, to understand the problem fully, as well as to understand what works and what doesn't work in real-life situations. So that means that all the actors that are acting if acting in one of the compartments need to work together in research and innovation. That means that we need to create spaces where these stakeholders meet. And actually, that is what responsible research and innovation tries to do. Research and innovation is a term that has been coined by the European Commission already in the early 10s, so it was around 20. 2011, where research is seen as inclusive for a diversity of, uh, of stakeholders, where we have anticipation and reflection on the future, together with those stakeholders, being transparent in communication and interaction, and have a research community that is really responsive to those inputs of stakeholders and takes action accordingly. Now, how does Fit for Food try to do that? First of all, it has a wide variety of stakeholders from research, policy, business, and civil society involved. And it brings it together at, in a platform at different levels. At EU level, you have various experts from science and from stakeholders together. We have 
policy labs at country level, at national level, and we have city labs at the level of cities. And they implement a systems approach and stakeholder participation. They, we provide training and support, insights and trends and policies, showcases and breakthroughs as content is brought in with methods and tools to achieve that we strengthen policy coherence and alignment. And that's more about the funding so that we see more programs funding food as a specific topic and promote research and innovation, responsible research innovation and the systems approach. We build competencies uh, on food systems R&I and RRI. Because what you see, because of the people have been working much more in a conventional way, they have missed out on many of the knowledge and skills needed to do it. So this will build the competencies. That's what the city labs specifically do, while the policy coherence is for the policy labs at national level. And together, all the different activities are meant to raise awareness. So on the one hand, we have the policy labs and the city labs working together, networking with all the different stakeholders and making things happen on the ground in a flexible, continuously adapting way. We follow that closely. So we provide training, but also really the support while they are working. The city and the, the food labs are coordinated by the science centers and science shops that build the city networks through stakeholder workshops, and they develop educational models to improve the competencies. But the educational models are built on the competencies as identified by the different stakeholders in the stakeholder workshops on what is really needed in the future to bring this food system transformation further. The policy labs are have the strong involvement of ministries. So they're very linked to the high level policy um, making in the countries where a dialogue is created with all sorts of different stakeholders to understand where are we now, where do we wanna go and how do we get there with respect to um, specific policies, methodologies and research and innovation programs. To conclude, what uh, Fit for Food does is very much argue that we need to change our research and innovation system so that we can serve better as a catalyst for food system transformation, that we really need system thinking and an active stakeholder involvement as prerequisites for research and innovation to contribute to the food system transformation, and that we need to raise awareness, build networks, and improve competencies to support that. And in the end, we establish this network, this Food 2030 network, with 25 labs at city and regional national level to create these networks that can sustain after the project terminates. Thank you very much. And here are the partners in the project, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, Jacqueline. So now we've seen all three presentations. I would like to open up the space for any questions. So we've already received quite a few questions through the chat function, and please do keep sending them through, and I'll direct them straight to the speakers, but please remember to add their names. So this first question is for Kelly. Um, and Kelly, our participant asks, what is your opinion of the short food supply chain? Are they good or only when they're fulfilling certain criteria? Sure, thank you very much for the question. Uh, just to, to explain for those that don't um, know about this term, short food supply chains are also called local food chains, alternative food networks, alternative food systems. Um, it refers to activities like farmers markets, box schemes, uh, community uh, supported agriculture schemes, which link up um, consumers with the producers of food uh, in, um, with only a short chain between them. Uh, the question about whether they're good, 
I think, you know, this question in itself highlights two really important considerations in terms of this sort of systems approach um, that we're all trying to, to take. The need to look holistically across, you know, health, economic, environmental, social dimensions of, this, of the system and, and the different considerations. Um, and the fact that um, ultimately some of these decisions are about values, about what people see as important, about what they value and prioritise in the system rather than anything we might be able to pin down in terms of a quantitative measure on what's good or bad. Um, so just to give a bit more detail, so in terms of economic benefits, obviously farmers can get a higher share of the value, they can revitalise local economies, um, social benefits involve reconnecting people, they can bring food to kind of food deserts where there's not a lot of healthy fresh food available and they can create community links. Um, but then if we look at health and environment, it becomes a bit more complicated. They may increase access to fruit and vegetables, but they're not necessarily selling healthy products. They can be sort of luxury high fat sugar products or meat and dairy. Um, let's not go into that in too much detail, but um, in terms of the environment, uh, it's also about multiple indicators of, of, of goodness. Um, so they may not perform as well in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions as a conventional supply chain, but they also may be using less packaging on fossil fuels. Um, um, and I think one important thing is that they're um, overall, they're good for the diversity and, and so they create system resilience. So uh, I think, um, yeah, it's there's no, I don't think there's any kind of um, concrete answer on whether they're good or not. But um, if you're particularly interested in that area, you could um, look at the work of the um, Brunori and Galli at Pisa University who worked on a big EU funded project called Glamour which looked at short supply chains and they have a lot more information there about different indicators and assessing them. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it does sound like there's a lot of factors involved with that. Um, so our second question, uh, I'm going to direct that to Karen. Um, the first question is, so the European Commission funds projects for three, four, even five years. How does the Commission build upon these projects to make sure that they align and also develop further on the goals of Food 2030? Well, thank you very much for listening and, and for, this, uh, for this question. Um, we have to say that um, uh, the follow-on from completed research in previous framework programs is definitely identified as a weakness. Uh, but in uh, Horizon Europe, we expect to uh, introduce better governance across the research and innovation sectors, which will improve the deployment and use of successful research results beyond the lifetime of the project, and of course, in line with our Food 2030 uh, goals and co-benefits. Um, this will be done through better and wider communication of impactful research and uh, a means to leverage and uh, alternative investments um, uh, in, in relation to food systems. You also have to think that um, in, in the past, research and innovation in, in relevant to food systems was very fragmented. And in this new vision of research and innovation policy for food system transformation, um, a, a multi-actor and engagement um, process will be fostered upstream and throughout the whole research and innovation process. And this is really a mechanism not just to arrive at more society, societally relevant outcomes, but also to build trust. Um, and long-lasting collaboration uh, that fosters mutual understanding and common goals. And we hope that by building mutual trust and, and these common goals, um, communities that, that come together will, uh, will survive the, the, the length of, of, of the projects and go beyond um, in, in their activities. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to jump straight over to Jacqueline. Um, our first question for you is, in your opinion, what is or are the biggest opportunities for implementing responsible research and innovation in the food system transformation? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think it's a very pertinent one, uh, basically because it provides you to look at where are the leverage points that could have the biggest impact. So, uh, and I would like to take it from the perspective of change agents. So who could be our most important change agents for fostering 
uh, responsible research and innovation. And first of all, I would say that uh, funding agencies have a very important role to play. As I showed in my presentation, are quite a number of barriers. Um, uh, and um, if funding agencies would more target responsible research and innovation as a prerequisite for funding, they could have an enormous impact uh, in the research community and, and the research and innovation projects taking place. So funding is a very important one. Um, but at the same time, we're talking about competencies as well. So uh, universities as places of education, but also perhaps higher vocational education places, maybe even in high schools, um, increasing competencies that are relevant for responsible research and innovation. So going beyond the conventional um, research skills actually uh, getting research skills so that you can integrate different types of knowledge so integrating scientific knowledge but also making explicit more experiential knowledge practical knowledge and bringing that into the research process as well as learning skills to interact with a wide variety of actors would be very beneficial so i think universities educational centers have an important role to play here um, but also research institutions in general could reward this type of research more in the sense that it does take more time and effort to, as a researcher to conduct responsible research and innovations. You have to do quite well a number of things extra, which is, has to do, amongst others, with the networking and the interaction with a wide variety of stakeholders. So making making this an, an asset, if you do this, and if you if you're capable of doing that, as a uh, as a um, yeah an, 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 a plus for your career as a researcher, that would be I think a very good opportunity. And um, at the same time, there is a lot of organisation that commission research. Uh, other than funding agencies, we have it at the municipality level. Uh, industry, um, but also provinces, etc. Within this food transformation, food system transformation, I think that that by actually pressing for this this form of research, asking an active role themselves, but also specifically also for other stakeholders such as consumers and citizens in general, this would be really helpful. So I think those are the leverage points I would like to point out. Perfect. Well, it sounds like there's really quite a lot of opportunities there. Um, I'm going to jump straight back to Karen um, and ask you this question. Are there any criteria in place or that will be developed that will be used to evaluate the stage of transformation of food systems towards sustainability? We don't actually have criteria in place at the moment uh, for this type of measurement, but um, we know that uh, such um, such criteria would be uh, needed. At least there is definitely uh, research and innovation needed to see what these criteria could be, also in view of really transitioning from A to B. Um, there is um, uh, currently we in the Commission are working on the farm to fork uh, communication that is expected to be adopted uh, at the end of this month. And within the context of, of that communication, uh, of course, there will be a number of, of actions and targets that will provide uh, um, a way forward to uh, transform food systems. So um, I think it will be a, a, a beacon for us also in terms of research and innovation, uh, what the next steps could be. And, uh, and much more work, of course, needs to be put into understanding food systems, coming up with ways in which to map them, just the current baseline um, uh, today. And, and of course, uh, the need for criteria uh, will, is, is, is there also. 
All right, thank you, Karen. Um, unfortunately, the hour um, has ended, um, but we have received a lot of questions. So we won't have enough time to answer them all, but we will be providing written answers, or at least the presenters will, following this webinar. And you can find these written answers on the registration page and Fit for Foods website in the next coming days. Once again, I would like to thank all our speakers for their insightful presentations as well as all of you for joining us during your lunch break or whenever else you are viewing this webinar. Keep an eye out for the rest of the webinars in this series uh, by subscribing to our newsletter um, or visiting the Fit for Food 2030 website. And as a final note, we invite you to tweet about what you can do to help transform your local food system. You can use the hashtag we saw on the introduction slide and you can tag at Sci Food Health um, to let us know. We look forward to hearing from you, and until next time, bye.